Hi there, and welcome to Military Histories, a podcast from York Army Museum. Each week we share an interview from the Royal Dragoon Guards Audio Archive. Throughout May and June we will be sharing interviews with World War II veterans. You can find more details about the Royal Dragoon Guards Oral History Project in the show notes. If you want to find out a bit more about our museum, there are links to our website and social media channels in the show notes too. In this week's interview you can hear Mr. Henry Garud discuss the build-up to D-Day and his wartime experiences including the liberation of a prisoner of war camp and relieving the boxer Max Schmeling of some cognac. Mr. Garud served with the 5th Inniskilling Dragoon Guards from 1942 to 1949. Thanks for listening, future episodes will drop every Friday. This interview is being conducted with Henry Garud, who was a crewman on, yes, on a Cromwell tank. On Cromwell tanks. And this interview is taking place at 1400 hours on the 10th of June 2013 in Sunrise Senior Living Accommodation at Brown Hall in Stockport. That's it. Where would you like to start, Henry? <coughs> well, let's start uh, on the build-up, I suppose, then to D-Day. As I said, we were we were doing tank practice at Kakubri, and we were there on D-Day. And then we were sent down by lorry to uh, Bury St Edmunds. And uh, what annoyed me... We passed, it was the Great North Road, A1, and we passed within 200 yards of my house and I couldn't go in. <laughs> anyway, we, we got to Bury St Edmunds and we were right next to a big RA, uh, big uh, Air F, American Air Force base. And we could watch the flying forces go out and in and coming back with engines missing, no undercar engine, oh God. Uh, and then suddenly they gave us 24 hours embarkation leave. Uh, well, I thought, oh my God, looked at the train time, was hopeless. Because I lived in Newark, you see, which is on the A1. So I thought, oh, well, sudden, I'll try hitchhiking. The first was a ride on a farmer's cart. <laughs> because I thought, if I get to the A1, I can be all right. So I got to the A1, and a jeep came along, so I f- flagged it down. It was two senior Canadian Air Force officers. They said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Newark. Oh, they said, we're going to York. Depend. They took me all the way to Newark, <laughs> said goodbye to all the family and so on. Got up crack of dawn next morning and got back on the A1 and managed to do fairly well. I had to walk the last eight miles. <laughs> I just got there. We had to be there for midday, you see. It was midday to midday. And I got there. So then, shortly after that, we were issued with what we need in France, uh, wound dressings and morphine and God knows what. Uh, and then suddenly we were told we were off. So we went on uh, t- the train down through London to Gosport. And uh, uh, we went right through London after they'd had a hell of a raid that night before with V1s, and it was a hell of a mess, and oh my God. Anyway, we got to Gosport, we got out of the lorries and had to walk part of the way to get down to the docks and <laughs> we passed a three-storey barracks occupied by the wrens mm. and all these young ladies all three floors <clears throat> were waving to us blowing us kisses god knows what all part of the morale booster we realized after it's a complete put-up job they did it for everybody <laughs> <laughs> I think um, half of Macora's girls from London. That's that's what they would call a target-rich environment <laughs> yes. in today's parlance. <laughs> oh dear. So we got to the docks and uh, the uh, the colonel in chief, and I can't remember his name now. He uh, he shook hands with each one of us at the bottom of the gang plant and wished us well. And we got onto this bloody tank landing craft, and uh, oh, it was a hell of a journey. We were right down in the bowels of the ship. It stank of diesel and people being sick. Oh, my God. I don't know where we went. We must have gone through the Bay of Biscay. I think it took us a hell of a time to get there. Anyway, eventually we got to Juneau Beach and got out. And uh, the first night was quite something. Uh, (laughs) 
we were allocated a field, one squadron on each of the fields around this one. And that night, a single German aeroplane came over, and 600 ships on the, on the channel opened fire, oh. and so did about 300 on land. Oh, God, they didn't have got it. No, nobody hit it. <laughs> no, but because all the stuff one that went up German. came down, and of we course. were showered with shrapnel. Yeah. <laughs> of course you would God. be. Yes. Anyway, so that was a good... And then, uh, what else happened after that? Oh, I say we'd... Uh, the CO and the adjutant went a day before us to get everything ready. But their boat got lost. They got there two days after we did. Oh. <laughs> wasn't quite the idea. No. <laughs> so they gave us the job of cleaning the tanks that had come over. God, there were thousands of the bloody things. Shermans, Cromwells, you name it. Uh, because they're all covered with grease to yes. come across. Yes, and so we had to degrease them. Mm. We did that for a day or two. And then they said, oh, make a good job of those, they're your own. Oh, thank God for that. Uh, by that time, the 4th County London Yeomanry had been completely wiped out at Villas Ricage, so we took over from them. It's in the Desert Rats, 7th Armoured. Mm -hmm. uh, in between times, though, they had a bright idea that we should go down to the, to the sea and have a swim and, and scrub our kit. The idea was to scrub all the blanco off and cover them with uh, uh, black boot polish. So we went down there, scrubbed our kit, put it over to dry and had the swim. Well, what they didn't tell us, that there were bomb craters on, just off the coast, 20 feet deep, and a hell of a strong current. And uh, the padre, the fantastic chap, he was a pre-war Olympic swimmer. And he must have saved about 20 of these lads, but it got too much for them. We lost the padre and six of our lads. Really? Yeah, we hadn't fired a bloody shot. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, it was very, one of them was my pal, Phil Bloom. Now, I was 19. He was older than us. He was about 26. But during the early part of the war, he'd been in the Metropolitan Police uh, during the Blitz, and he'd seen all these people killed and knocked about, so he said, sod it, I'll get my revenge. He never fired him, and he shot at all. Shame. Anyway, that was it. So we got these tanks, and off we went. <laughs> uh, the first day we out, my pal Charlie Ray was killed. Uh, it could have been me, but it wasn't. It was Charlie. And Charlie is a fantastic jet. He never made a he never made a soldier. He just wasn't the right shape. But a fantastic teacher. He told me all I knew about wireless, and uh, he just had a son. I don't think I ever saw this son. Uh, I mean, I I was free. It didn't matter. But poor old Charlie. Uh, what happened? Uh, we'd we'd stopped in this little copse, the four headquarter tanks. We were TAC HQ. Tac HQ. Yes. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, his little tiny cops, and suddenly Jerry started shelling us. And, of course, the shells were hitting the bloody trees and all the shrapnel came down, and I, I dodged. I think I got inside the tank. But poor old Charlie, he was outside. I saw him lying on the ground. I thought, he's all right. He was, you know, he's like this, you see. I thought, he's just protecting himself. And then after that, I heard his stretcher bearers wanted. And it seems he got a, a bloody great lump of shrapnel right through his lungs, and that was it. So that was a good start. Oh, and uh, yes, we had a young lad. I can't remember his name. He was uh, he was a divisional uh, uh, runner. He was a runner, a swimmer, God knows what else. Uh, he lost his foot. He's, he was in a honey tank and it hit a mine and it blew his foot off. So uh, not a very good start, really. After that, things livened up a bit. And then uh, I say what I remember is outside Khan. We were there. It was uh, essential that the British Army got through Khan, and it was just as essential for the German Army that we wouldn't. They brought in more tanks, God knows what. Anyway, we stood there. All the guns uh, on the channel were firing, and so was the ones on the boat on shore. Suddenly, there was a deathly silence. They all stopped, and then we heard the roar of aero engines. 2,000 bombers came over, two, including 500 Lancasters. <gasps> and they just bombed the whole bloody place, the Khan. There were 6,000 civilians killed. I mean, they did warn them a couple of days before uh, that there was going to be a raid. Some of them got out, others either couldn't or wouldn't. And uh, 
a lot of them were sheltering in cellars. Well, cellars aren't much good with, uh, with, with bloody great bombs. <laughs> the concussion yeah. killed them, yeah. So uh, that was not good. Anyhow, just, when, just, when they told us to move forward, we couldn't move forward because of the just, rubble. We, exactly. We had to get armoured bulldozer to make a way so we could even get through. Oh, God. I'll come back to that at a later stage. Because right. Of course, that must have created a lot of ill feeling with the French. Well, or not. you would have thought so, but I don't know. Because, uh, you see, uh, I went back with the regiment for the 65th anniversary mm -hmm. and God. They treated us like royalty. Really? Yeah, they did. And Khan, we went, we landed at Khan. It's a beautiful city now, but, you know, yeah. I suppose that's war, you know, but no, it did seem a shame at the it time. Does, it does. So? And, and then we see, uh, yep. it wasn't long after that, we, we were supposed to be attacking Mount Pinkong. Yes, I know it. And uh, at the bottom of there, we were getting ready, and suddenly a browning opened up. I don't know whether it, it was an electric fault or, or whether the gun was trigger happy. Anyhow, it, it opened up and uh, it shot the adjutant completely to ribbons. That was Captain Williams, a lovely chap. And that was when Captain, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, God, young chap, useless. <laughs> <laughs> I not recall that. No, no, what, what have you said, Tom? <laughs> Oh dear. Anyway. He, was a, he was a young officer anyway, but that, I mean, that goes with the territory, really, doesn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I remember I was, one night I was sitting in the tank on my own, read, writing a letter to my mum with the fe feeble light of the inside, mm. and uh, Jerry started shelling us, and uh, <laughs> the flap opened and jumped a bloke. It was, it was the adjutant. And he said, he asked me if I was frightened. <laughs> he was obviously bloody frightened. <laughs> I said, well, uh, I said, well, I'm not frightened to die. I said, what am I frightened of? I'm being severely disabled, blinded, or lose a couple of legs or something. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I said, my biggest fear is that when the shit hits the fan, I should uh, make a pig's ear and let the regiments and the squadron down. And I said, I sincerely hoped that my, the discipline and the training I'd had would hold me in good stead. <laughs> yes, yes. Ah, <laughs> uh, God. It, it was very difficult to take prisoners on tanks. There was just no room for them. So uh, what we used to do was to take the boots off and take the belts off so that if they decide to escape, they'd be barefooted and lose their trousers. And then we'd wait, leave for the infantry to pack up. Uh, anyhow, the first belt I looked at, I thought, my goodness, it said there, "Got mit us, God with us. And I thought, I thought the Lord was supposed to be on our side. <laughs> <laughs> and every German soldier wore a belt with that on. God mit uns. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that bit. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, dear. I'll switch it off a bit and I'll tell you some more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is when Henry nearly got his, yeah, right. let's say. <laughs> well, I, I'm very short. I was only five foot four at the best. And that served me in very good stead in Norway, in Normandy, because uh, uh, as we were tootling along, I had to keep an eye on the, he the hedges and ditches on the right-hand side to see if there were any Germans, they were Panzerfaust, and on the other side, the tank commander would be watching. Anyway, going along beautifully, and suddenly there's a hell of a bang and a whistle, and my aerial had gone. It must have been either a sniper, or it could have been a Panzerfaust, but there was, the aerial was taken just two inches above my head. If I'd have been two inches higher, that would have been good by Henry. <laughs> a real near miss, close shaving tech, in fact. Um. Oh dear, now this friendly fire, well, I don't know. Uh, we'd advanced about 70 miles through Belgium, and in those days, for a complete armoured division, that was quite something. And it, was re it really was liberation at, at its best, because we went through little towns and villages that were untouched by the war, and all the civilians came out and threw flowers on the tanks, and they gave us bottles of wine. And, and anyhow, in the afternoon, we parked and spread out in uh, cornfields. 
waiting for the transports to come up. We didn't need much ammunition. We hadn't used a lot, but we needed petrol. Mm. Uh, so there we were. And uh, every night, what we used to do, in the late afternoon, if we stopped for more than 20 minutes, we'd dig a hole uh, two feet deep and big enough for four of us to sleep in. And then we'd run the tank over the top and then put the tarp all in there to keep it clean. And it was a damn good job we did it that night because, first of all, three Spitfires came over with cannon firing and they shot us up. Well, we threw out our tarpaulins with a big white star on and we threw out a centre power yellow smoke, which was supposed to be the signal, and they pushed off. We thought, oh, well, that's it. Anyhow, they must have gone back and reported and found a large concentration of German armour because that night the Lancasters came Gosh. over. <laughs> I said I, I'd never seen my crumble jump before, but it jumped that night. <laughs> yes, I mean, that uh, sounds like a it was a very good job. We were well spread out because uh, mm. we we were very lucky. Really, uh, we lost three lorries. I think there's a petrol lorry and an ammunition lorry, and one or two chaps were wounded, and I think one or two might have been killed because the whole division was there. Mm -hmm. uh, anyhow, we were very lucky under the circumstances. God. <laughs> hmm. yes. Lack of communication. You it know. is sounds like it, and it, I don't think things have improved much in no, the, the modern so. times because we still hear of these friendly fire accidents. Although these days they call them blue on blue. Oh, do they? Oh, do yes, they? Oh. It's blue on blue, but it still means the same thing. Some idiots got no, the wrong no, coordinates. No. <laughs> what you you were? Uh, Have you got? You got thanks to the RAF there. Uh, yeah, you've got thanks to the RAF next to next to that. I don't one, know if dare put that yeah. in. <coughs> oh dear, oh dear. Well, you can come on to that one because you've also got, uh, what's this about an honorary member? You were an honorary member oh, of, some, yes. of something or other. Yes, yes, that was it. <laughs> uh, yes, as I say, uh, see, there were five of us in each tank crew and we each had a specific job. I was the wireless operator gun loader, but we were all trained to everything in case of emergencies. Of course. And uh, we were there one day and uh, uh, with us we always had... Uh, the uh, chief observation officer of the artillery. And he had a Cromwell exactly the same as ours, but he had more radio sets so he could keep in touch with all his batteries. Mm -hmm. And uh, his driver went out to, to answer the call of nature and trod on a uh, um, personnel mine and lost half of his leg. So I was told to drive the tank for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, I reckon that makes me an honorary member of the Third Royal Horse Artillery. <laughs> yes, and you mentioned uh, you, you called them the elite. Oh, they were. Was this was this a, a sideways dig, or were they? Well, the elite? no, they were. You see, with us, uh, each of the regiments had uh, one troop or a battery with them. We had mm. th we had three. They were uh, twenty five pounders mounted on ram tanks right. chassis. And they were fantastic. They never missed. No, the 25-pounder had a oh, really good uh, yeah, record. They, yes. And and what was the Cromwell armed with? Was it seven, just purely 75 millimetre? 75 millimetre. Millimetre. Bloody useless. Mm. I think I said in there somewhere yeah. that the uh, the 88 millimetre could knock us out about two miles. At 250 yards, I was just bounced off. It was pretty useless. It really was. Shocking, isn't it? So Our only hope was the typhoons, uh, the RF typhoons. With tank we had a, rockets. Yeah, we had a, if the weather was anything like that, we had a taxi service overhead and we yes, could call them down. That's it, call them in from and, the uh, rank. Uh, I, I saw them work once. Mm. God, uh, yeah, there, was, there was this uh, tiger tank, ooh, just up the road sort of thing. Yeah. And somebody obviously told the lads where it was. And uh, this typhoon came down. God almighty, the row of the engine roar and then the rockets, God, it put the fear into anybody. You see, they don't aim the, <laughs> don't aim the rockets. Aim the just aim the aircraft. <laughs> Down they come. Bloody hell. Um, <coughs> and the the, uh, the turret of the tire attack, it just went up in the air. Fantastic. To, because they lost 400 of their lads in Normandy. Mm. They're, they're pretty good, I must say. Anyway. Press so, on. leading on to the RAF, you've got thanks to the RAF. <laughs> yes. 
yes. They, this was a stand to. Uh, yes, we we had to stand to at half past four every morning, you see, uh, ready for the Germans to counterattack. And then uh, at half past five, we were allowed to stand down to make some breakfast and get ready to move off. Mm-hmm. And whilst we were doing that, a Lancaster came over at tree top level, uh, obviously to dodge the radar. And it was so low that the, the pilot and the co-pilot and the rear gunner, they all gave us a friendly wave. And we did the same. <laughs> and one of the blokes said, oh, well done the RAF. Thank God, there'll be a few less Nazis for us to deal with. And, and another bloke said, hey, hang on, he said. <laughs> he said, in an hour, an hour and a half, he said, they'll be back in England. They'll be having a fantastic breakfast of real... F- eggs and bacon and, and then they'll go and have a lovely sleep in white sheets and if it's if they're not on duty tonight he said they'll be in the local pub with their girlfriends and wives drinking pop of beer and he said and what about us he said we <laughs> sleep in a hole in the ground with our boots on where everything we eat is powdered powdered tea powdered milk powdered sugar and he said it's about to get a tin of sardines and and uh, he said, if it rains, we get wet. If it's, if it's hot, we swelter. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Uh, so, uh, and he said, well, he said, it could be worse. We could be in the jungle in Burma. And yeah. So, it's sail again. Good old RAF. <laughs> mm, that, was, uh, that was the RAF. No one else was it. Oh, you were wounded. You were wounded in the petrol tank, I believe. Oh, yes. Oh, mm. nasty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you see, I had the job of being the uh, wireless operator on the rear link at night. A, uh, during the day, there was a, a Royal Signal sergeant, but my pal and I, we had to take turns at night to man this special wireless set in the Colonel's tank. He had two. Uh, and uh, one night, I got this message... Sunray to set. That meant they wanted to talk to the colonel, uh, the brigadier at the other end. You see, <laughs> so I nipped out of the tank to go and find the colonel's tank, and Jerry started shelling like hell, very accurately. So I nipped out of the first vehicle, which happened to be a Daimler scout car, a dingo. And so I was out of there for a couple of minutes, and suddenly, my chest and my stomach felt warm and wet. I thought, oh my God, I've been wounded. So when the shelling dropped off a bit, I I got up out from underneath and I found... I mean, it's a good job I wasn't smoking, because I was always smoking. (laughs) (laughs) When I got out, I found it wasn't blood, it was petrol. What had happened, a piece of shrapnel had gone through the petrol tank of this scout car and it was dripping on me. (laughs) You were lucky you weren't smoking. I was. (laughs) Oh, dear. Uh, <clears throat> you got the message to the CO, though. Yes, he wasn't yeah. very pleased at two o'clock in the morning. No, we waked him up. <laughs> now this, this, this next little incident in the summer of '44, um, the maternity break. Oh It yes. almost sounds a bit like the old football in the First World War <laughs> trenches. It was That's amazing. Sort of, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me have my notes there. Let's <laughs> just get it right. <laughs> Oh yes, uh, summer of 44. We were making reasonable progress through Holland. At the entrance to the next village, uh, there was a roadblock between the first two houses and what looked like two very nasty anti-tank guns pointing through. So we used plan B. The tanks all moved off the road to spread out and we got our infantry, the Rife Brigade, to get out of their, uh, what do you call them, half-tracks and make their way across either side to attack from the flanks. When all of this was started up, two Germans appeared from behind this barricade waving a white flag. We thought, oh my God, they want to surrender. Oh no, they wanted to powwow. There was a young officer, he he spoke perfect English with an Eton accent. He explained that in the village there was a Dutch lady and she was having a baby and there were serious complications. He wanted to know, did we have a doctor who could see to her? If so, we would have a truce for an hour. <laughs> That's amazing. So, so the CO got onto our MO and uh, 
He said, well, I'll have a go, he said. But his driver said, bloody ridiculous, he said, they'll, they'll treat us as uh, human shields or hostages. And you know, the, the MO decided to go, so they moved part of the barricade and they went in. And it was fantastic. For a whole hour, we could sit on the grass and have a lovely cup of coffee without being shelled, bombed, shot at. <laughs> and the MO went in there and he sorted this lady out, and saw the baby was all right, took a baby and the, and the mother down in the cellar uh, and came away. And at the end of the hour, the white flag was taken down and we started killing each other again. That is so... That is so... <laughs> <laughs> it just shows you, though, Henry, humanity. Yes, does I, uh, shine I hope that that German officer got away with it because yes. he was—he was obviously a bit of a gentleman. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> that was a <clears throat> maternity break. Um, we follow on then from the in, during your northwest campaign. Um, you were still in the tank troop in regimental headquarters, mm -hmm. and. This is my, your most important wireless message. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I dare tell them that one. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh dear. Yes, as I said, my job during the Northwest Europe campaign was wireless operator, a gun loader, and a Cromwell tank. I was in Tank Troop Regimental Headquarters Squadron. There were four tanks the commanding officers, the second commands, the adjutants, and the intelligence officer. We were Tactical HQ. I was in the fourth tank, the CO's protection tank. Wherever the CO went, the other three tanks went. And if his tank was knocked out or broke down, he rapidly transferred to ours. Uh, I'll miss that bit out there. Yeah, the CO's tank had two radios. One in the usual place in the turret on which he could speak to every tank in the regiment, supporting artillery, medical officers, all the other vehicles whilst the other wireless replaced the machine gun in the code driver's place next to the driver. This wireless set was on the brigade frequency, so our CO could talk to the brigadier and vice versa. Uh, yeah, during the day, this vital real link was manned by a Royal Signal Officer's uh, NCO, but my pal and I were specially picked out to relieve him at night in four stints. We never found out why, but I think it was A, we had both been to grammar school and spoke King's English, and B, neither of us had a pronounced accent. So many of the lads had broad accents, Irish, Scottish, Geordie, Scouse, Cockney. It was difficult to understand them normally and impossible when they got a bit excited on the, on the wireless. Yes, at night uh, we had what we call mush. It was atmospherics mm. on the on the and, and uh, a hell of a hell of a noise. It was very difficult to hear, and I was dead scared that I'd be caught by it if I missed a message from Brigade HQ. So, so there were HF radios, not uh, VHF. No, no, there were nineteen sets. Nineteen no, sets. Yep. Yes. Not would have been a, a bit HF. Yes. Um. Oh yes. So. One night I was on duty there and uh, the uh, infantry out front reported that the Germans were preparing to make a counterattack with thousands of infantry, tanks, artillery, God knows what. Uh, now, what, what we did every day, during, before it got dark, all the guns would range onto different targets, uh, bridges, uh, crossroads, all sorts of... Uh, uh, possible targets where the Germans would be and each one was given a code name each target and uh, and then they were given the other code which was the number of guns whether just one battery or one regiment or the whole of the lot so on this night uh, it was decided they'd better give them the full treatment <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it was my job to get onto the artillery and uh, tell them what it was. Um, we said, I said, I, ran, I got on there from Abel Baker, Charlie, 16, and he came in. Uh, I said, 16, Gypsy, Gypsy, Victor, Target. Gypsy, 
<laughs> meant the whole bloody lot and the whole of the guns. Uh, yes, gypsy meant all the pre-selected target need to be blasted, and vi victor meant all 600 guns were to be used. Five. Wilco, wait out, said the artillery officer. 600 guns. Yes, about five minutes later, having disturbed the sleet of every 30 core gunner, he said, firing now out. And then hell was lit. 600 guns had opened up. All the different calibers whistling and screaming overhead and landing on the targets. And uh, they made a damn good job of it because that German invasion didn't happen anymore. <laughs> not, not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so it was better than normally fifth, normally fifth bonfire night. So needless to say, the German counterattack failed to materialise. Yes, I think that was my most, most important message. God. <laughs> and, and it still goes on. It still goes on today. As my son was in the uh, second invasion of Iraq. Oh my goodness! Oh God. Two thousand, whenever it was, two thousand and one. Uh, and <clears throat> he said it was just like fireworks night. Oh. The amount of stuff that went flying over their heads. It's just unbelievable. Yes, all those six hundred guns over. opened up, and my God! Mm. Which brings me to a pretty personal thing, really. I suppose. What about fear? Fear of fear itself. You meant you mentioned at one. Well, stage. yeah, that, that's what I said in there. <coughs> yes. Was it when, when Captain Williams was killed? That, that's have we already yes. mentioned that. Yeah, we did mention that. Yes. Rupert, Captain Rupert Tettle. That was the new bloke. Right. He was about twenty-two. And he asked me if I was frightened. Yeah, mm. I knew his son. <laughs> <laughs> son? Mm. His camp, yeah, his it's camp. funny, our Colonel, Colonel Swettenham and uh, Rupert Kettle, they both died. Recently? No, years ago. Really? Yeah. I mean, they weren't old. No. I think one was out in South Africa or something. They both, I remember reading, oh my God. Hey, what amazes me, when I get the magazine, the obituaries. Oh, right, yeah, I know, that worries me. Find a lot of the blokes joined the regiment and they died. They yeah. didn't join until years after I left. <laughs> so, well, I was quite young. <clears throat> well, I joined in 64. <laughs> and I'm reading about a lot of my contemporaries yeah, amazing. Who, have, who have passed on. Oh, no stamina, that's what it is. That's it. Cold, <laughs> cold as charity. Just... <laughs> what was that all about? <laughs> <laughs> it was December 44. The tank regiment was in Holland and it was cold, very, very cold. The worst in Dutch records, temperatures down to minus 15 centigrade. Even the petrol froze and we had to keep the tank engines running to stop them freezing solid. To make a cup of tea, we had to thaw out blocks of ice. On one occasion, I was outside the tank when Jerry started shelling us. I dived underneath our crummel, but the ground was so slippery that I slid out to the front in the open air at the front. <laughs> Stupid boy. <laughs> Boy <laughs> then, then it snowed heavily and we had to paint the tanks white. Well, that was fun. Uh. This was before emulsion paint, so we used a sort of whitewash, very messy. Mm. Our billet was a bombed-out house with no doors or windows and very little roof. At night, our crew of five, if not on guard or wireless watch, huddled together to try and keep warm. This was called static warfare. We could not do much apart from taking care of our vehicles, guns and equipment. We were getting desperately short of petrol, ammunition and food. Every tin of sardines, gallon of petrol and bullet still had to be brought by lorry over 400 miles across broken bridges and shocking roads from the Normandy bridgehead. The snow and ice was the last straw. Then we were ordered to make a strategic withdrawal of about one and a half miles to straighten the line. This was fun. Two of our tanks placed into position before the sharp frost had sunk in 15 inches of mud. Normally, no problem, but the ground was now so hard that the 600 horsepower Rolls-Royce Spitfire engines wouldn't shift the tanks. So we used two more tanks as tow trunks, but their tanks just slithered on the ice. So with great reluctance, we had to abandon the two tanks. Under German shell fire, we sold everything we could carry, maps, code books, small arms, ammunition, hand grenades, you name it, the crew's kit and uh, and the rest of the rations. Then we set fire to both of them. 
It's amazing how much inflammable material is in a tank. 100 gallons of petrol, 20 gallons of engine and gearbox oil, 20 solid rubble tires on the bogey wheels, phosphorus grenades, 30 or so high explosive shells, padding for seats, etc. So they made a lovely bonfire and kept us quite warm for an hour or two. <laughs> you weren't worried about ricochets around the back of your way. <laughs> and then the other bit, Silent Night, Holy Night. <laughs> oh, right, yes. Mm. Oh, dear. So yeah. they tried that as well, playing yeah, in hymns at right night up, yeah. time. Yeah. Gosh, it does sound like the First World War trenches again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. During the bitter cold, the static warfare in Holland in December '44 referred to earlier in cold as charity, our thoughts turned to happier Christmases at home. To cheer us up, the Germans suddenly installed high-powered loudspeakers. They plied Silent Night, Holy Night, and Bing Crosby's White Christmas. <laughs> then a kind gentleman told us we were losing the war, that Field Mouse from Montgomery was going to get us all killed. We should be sensible and surrender. He assured us we would be given warm accommodation, excellent meals, and comfortable beds with white sheets. He did not seem to know we'd already defeated Rommel's Africa Corps in North Africa, liberated France, Belgium, and half of Holland, and were through Sicily and playing havoc in Italy. At first we thought this was highly amusing and it helped to break the monotony. But after a week of the same spiel it began to get on our nerves. So we devised a plan. In our division we had Royal Corps of Signals friends. We asked them to set up directors, direction finders half a mile apart. Where the two's rays crossed was the exact location of the German broadcasting equipment. We also had with our regiment K Battery 3rd Royal Horse Artillery, the Elite. The battery consisted of three priests which were 25 pounder artillery guns mounted on Canadian ram tank chassis with armoured plated gun shields. They were always available for immediate action and were renowned for accuracy. The shells they used were flash free and smoke free so the enemy could not tell where the guns were located. So we gave our friends the gun as the map reference given to us by the Royal Signals and suggested five rounds rapid from each gun. Hardly goodwill to all men, but at least it was peace on earth for a while. <laughs> that shut him up. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would tend to agree with that. That would have been the best thing possible. <laughs> shut up, you annoying person. <laughs> oh dear, dear. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. You had a you had a one short leave at home when you went <laughs> rabbiting. Yes, with my I believe. father. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was fun. That was. Good. Yes, he suggested we went to see if we could find a couple of rabbits, and we each have a double barrel shotgun. So we were strolling along, and suddenly a rabbit appeared. So I fired with both barrels from the from the waist. <laughs> Rabbit just disappeared. <laughs> My father said, God, that was quick. I said, Yeah, well, where I've been, you had to be quick. I said, Is that him or you? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, the rabbits weren't shooting. Didn't back. expect the rabbit to fire back. <laughs> oh yes. dear, oh dear. Um, you mentioned a little bit about when you crossed the, uh, when you crossed oh, the, the Rhine into Germany. Oh, yes. Well, that was fun too, yes. Yes, we'd been by the side of the so Rhine. You, how did you get across the, the Rhine? Did you use Ooh, boats or was it a, no, did somebody no. find a bridge? We went on a Bailey Bridge. Bailey Bridge. Uh, yeah, well, let me gosh, tell you, I'll tell you about that then. We, we were alongside the mm. Rhine there for, God knows, about four or five weeks. And while right. we were there, we, all, we kept burning old engine oil in drums so that it gave a complete smoke screen so the Germans couldn't tell exactly where we were going to come from, right. what we were doing or anything else. Uh, so everything we ate and drank tasted of bloody engine oil. <laughs> well, I, I, yes. Yeah. Anyway, so eventually on the 25th of March, I think it was, it all started. There was one hell of an artillery barrage uh, and then uh, the sun was blacked out by planes and gliders. 35,000 men came over in parachutes or gliders and uh, we watched all this happen. But one <laughs> one of the uh, the gliders had taken the rope off too soon and it mm. landed on our side. And these young lads, they weren't very happy. <laughs> they spent two years training for this. <laughs> they were all done up with. 
black faces, bandoliers of ammunition, you look at you, you name it. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, and then the uh, <clears throat> the engineers they did a fantastic job. I mean, the shell fire, um, uh, rifle fire, and every other bloody fire, they uh, they built this platoon bridge. Mm -hmm. Now, until I saw the Rhine, I'd no idea how big it was. It is big. I've been <laughs> over it. It's big. <laughs> <laughs> thought, oh my God! And the, oh, a very hell? strong current as well. Yeah, how are you going to put a bridge over that? Well, they use these pontoons, and uh, you know, they link them all together, yeah. and then they put the bridge on the top. But uh, <laughs> as soon as the tanks got on, the bloody pontoons sank. Yes. All you could see was a white tape on either side, providing you kept between the two white tapes. You, you stayed you're on the bridge. All right. <laughs> because with this strong current. The whole bloody bridge went round a nice delicate arch. So it was <laughs> ah, so perfect. It wasn't quite perfect. It wasn't dead straight, you know. <laughs> but God, I was glad. I was glad when we got the other side. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and then there's a bit about the loot, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. When you crossed over, you started looting the jet. Well, not quite. It, it was um, battlefield finds, as yes. they say. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. <laughs> Yes, I don't know if you had the same thing. We had these uh, s sheet steel bins. They welded them up either, either side of the tunnel to give us a bit of extra space. I've had a similar experience. Uh, so, <laughs> so I put, I put my beautiful roll of material, which would have just been enough to make my two sisters a, a lovely summer dress each. It was lovely material. Goodness mm. me! It was the pre-war stock, is yes, it? Yes. Yeah. And uh, so I put it in this bin. And about three weeks later, we'd been hell of a dow after that, and we had to pull back to do a bit of maintenance. And uh, I thought, well, I'll have a look at my magnificent roll of material. I opened the top. <laughs> and nothing came out but... <laughs> Just bloody lace. <laughs> there was a piece big enough to make a handkerchief. <laughs> Some mm. Jerry used it as a target for his spando, I think. Oh, similar, similar thing happened to me in <laughs> When on, on live firing in Canada, I was in my tank, buttoned down, and some infantry decided to have some fun shooting up my bins. Ah! So they shot a few bit, shot a few holes, and then when I opened up one of the bins, my sleeping bag had disintegrated. Just got a, <laughs> I, I just got a bin full of feathers. <laughs> so I have been there. You've I been know there. Been, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yes. The, the infantry, uh, the, was, with the Canadian that infantry, was my the, bit of the loot. Bandus. And I said, never, never um, mind. And then you ran into some strange people, the uh, SAS. Oh, yes. Dodgy fellas. I suppose I could put that in there. It's a long time ago, isn't it? Yes, they were, they were uh, very good, those lads. Yes, yeah, so the only one morning they, they came in and they said, have you got a spare cup of tea or a bit of breakfast for us? And these, just these four chaps in this jeep and... Uh, they uh, didn't have any sort of badges of rank, and one chap wore a kilt, another one had a beard. They all spoke four languages, and uh, the jeep was a bit special. They didn't have a windscreen, it had two Vickers Cave machine guns, <laughs> <laughs> the same at the back as well. Right. And uh, <laughs> the jeep itself, oh my God, in there they'd got landmines, they'd got two... Uh, uh, two uh, snipers' rifles with uh, <coughs> lovely sights and uh, hand grenades, you name it, gun. And apparently, what they used to do, they used to they used to drive through the German lines and get about ten miles behind their lines and try and find a German convoy, and then they join the convoy. Now, to get there, they uh, they put a, a very ornate uh, uh, German flag on the front of their jeep. And they all wore Nazi armbands. So that got them through most uh, of the German checkpoints. But I if not, I mean, they just, just start shooting. <laughs> throw a couple of grenades and <laughs> open up with a Vickers K. And <coughs> anyway, once they got in the uh, convoy, they would, uh, they would travel along at the same speed, you see, the same spacing, until they came to a side road, I would say. They knew every side road car farm track in Germany, it seems to me. So they'd wait until they got near one of these side roads, and then they'd let uh, they'd throw these landmines over the back f to catch the troop they lorried for. They'd opened up with the vicar's guns and throw hand grenades and gun knows what, and then they'd nip smartly down the side road and away before the Germans had time to do anything. 
they did that time and time again. <laughs> and I say the uh, you'd ha you'd have to be crazy to join an outfit like that. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I said we we gave him a cup of tea and so and then we yeah. we went to back our, our normal warfare. <laughs> And that eventually took you in right into Germany, where you yeah. uh, bumped into the oh, Brazil yeah. War Camp. Yes, I was surprised there weren't some skins in there because someone were. Yeah, 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 you could yeah. have found some from Dunkirk. Yeah, yeah. So we moved into. We came across it. The German guards had disappeared when they heard the tanks coming up the road, and uh, the chaps were very pleased to see us. But uh, some of them said, "Where the hell have you been for the last five years?" <laughs> <laughs> Grateful. <laughs> Gratitude, that was their first mistake. <laughs> anyway, we gave them cigarettes and all sorts of things. We could have spare socks and bandages. And, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, some have been there since Dunkirk. Others have been captured in Norway and God knows where else. Mm -hmm. But one lad, he'd only been there ten days. He was a Spitfire pilot. <laughs> he got, got shot down. Uh, anyway, then we... Uh, we told them to get back into their lovely huts and get some rest, wait for the army to catch them up and then fly them back to England. And so uh, we were told, driver advance, off we went. <laughs> and then <coughs> you ran into a shell in uh, just outside of <laughs> Hamburg. Yes. yes, our poor old Cromwell tank, it took us all the way from northern France through Belgium, Holland, over the Rhine to Germany, right across to Hamburg, and then we were shooting up a, a, a wood that seemed to have German infantry. We were shooting it up with our beezer from the turret, and suddenly there was a bloody great bang, and the tank shook. So we bailed out very smartly. Fortunately, it didn't catch fire. Normally, they went up in flames, mm. and you'd got twelve seconds to get out because of the petrol and ammunition would go. Yep. I mean, the, the Sher ours was a crumb, actually. The, the Shermans, the Germans call, call them Tommy Cookers. Uh, you, you anyway. I think the Americans called them Ronsons. Yes. Because they lit first time. <laughs> they lit first time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we got a good look round, and it had, it had buckled <clears> up <throat> two of the uh, bogey wheels and buckled the engine compartments, and, uh, and then we were looking round, and we found the nose cap. And it was a 250 millimetre naval shell. Good grief. We thought, bloody hell. <laughs> it, was a, it was about 10 days later we found out what had happened. The RAF had sunk a, battle, a German battle cruiser in the harbour, but the, the guns were still above water, so the sods we were using was artillery. <laughs> anyway, as I say, we thought, Oh, we'll be all right now for a week behind the lines and be able to have a bath and clean uniform and get a decent meal and get some nice sleep. Oh, no. We had a new tank in about two hours. So we had Good to grief. Transfer all the equipment <laughs> <laughs> into the breach once more, dear friends. Oh, no. Just when you thought you were going to have a break. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, it's a grand life, we don't we? And near to the end, um, you actually entered uh, Hamburg when they oh, yes oh. they were about to give an ultimatum to the city. Yes, we were. I heard the brigadier of the artillery talking to our CO, and he <clears> said, "I'm sending an ultimatum. If they don't surrender, I'm going to give them an El Alamein barrage." <laughs> God, so. Anyhow, the general decided to surrender. And I was, we crossed this bloody great cast iron bridge. I mean, it was very high and a lot of water underneath. <laughs> I could never could swim. I thought, <laughs> I thought I bet the sun will blow this where I get halfway across. No, we got over all right. Uh, but anyway, uh, all these German soldiers, sailors, marines, whatnot, they were all there in groups of ten with their rifles piled up very neatly in front of them. And uh, the civilians, they waved us on. They'd had enough. <laughs> mm. oh dear. But it would have been a complete waste of firing all those guns because there was nothing there to be to seen. Knock down. Really. Nothing to knock down. It all would have been flattened. The, uh, the, there are about oh, thousands of civilians living there, but they're all living in what was left of the cellars mm -hmm. or in shacks that they'd built from the rubble. Because what had happened, they'd had a firestorm. Yeah. And my God, there were 8,000 burnt to death one night. Well, a lot of them, they weren't burnt, they're in the cellars. And it simply sucked all the 
oxygen out of their lungs. And they mm. weren't wounded, burnt, they just died. Suffocated. Yep. Mm. So, that was Hamburg. <laughs> wow. Well, yes, I, I, I don't suppose there was much sympathy at the time for the Germans. No, no, no. No. But you see, we... Uh, oh, <laughs> that's right, we were all set to go up to Denmark to see all these beautiful young ladies up there because oh, right. we weren't allowed to fraternise with the German girls, you see. No. Uh, anyhow, at the last minute, they changed their minds. We'd, we'd stopped up the back to the tank with petrol cans and God knows what... And they said, no, we're sending the airborne up instead because they've oh. got jeeps and they won't tear the road up. <laughs> we weren't very pleased about that. Mm. So what we had to do, we had to, fire, uh, we had to make a, a line right across Schleswig-Holstein, the narrow bit, to search all the troops coming down from Denmark. And uh, one of them was Max Schmeling, the pre-war boxer. boxer. Yeah. <laughs> Right. And I relieved him of a bottle of Hennessy's Three Star Cognac. <laughs> oh, so you didn't have to hit him to do it. <laughs> <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't a big and brave in front of my stem. <laughs> yeah, it does, tend, it does tend to even things up. I mean, you were, what, five foot four? Yeah. And he was about six foot four. Yes. <laughs> Bloody great. <laughs> Max Schmeling. Mm. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah, dear. I remember. I know. Uh, so you finally... Oh, I um, did. Ooh, didn't do... Uh, which which bit did you miss out, if any? Wilderhausen. <laughs> Wilderhausen. What happened there? That was before the prison of war camp. Well, uh, no, after that, it was when we were going through Germany. Oh, right. And uh, one night we came to this little town called Wilderhausen. And uh, it was a very nice little town. All the civilians had gone. And they said for the first time ever, we could go into the houses and use the beds and all the other facilities. So we did that. They said, you'll be all right, the infantry are well out front, and behind you, you've got the North Yeomanry with their uh, tank busters, the M10 tank busters. Mm -hmm. So we settled down in these lovely beds and proper toilets and things, and suddenly there was a hell of a noise going on. <laughs> we went out and jumped onto our tank. As we could see, the, uh, the squadron leader's scout car was burning, and from the flames we could see this German Mark IV tank coming down the road. <laughs> now, we couldn't turn the tank around because we're in this narrow road. And then we found, God, we couldn't turn the turret either because we'd piled it up with t uh, jerry cans full of petrol ready for the next day. Oh, crap. <laughs> so when we thought all was lost, <laughs> the, uh, the squadron leader's tank would park by the side of the a house. Uh, see, the, the, that was the road, you see. This, yeah. this tank was parked there, you see. Right. And the bloke, the gunner was inside, riding to his mum or something, and he heard all this noise. He looked out through his telescope, and all he could see was this black cross on the side of this German tank. <laughs> so with his 95 millimetre, he pressed the button. <laughs> it was five yards range. <laughs> Couldn't miss. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the end of the German tank, thank God. Good grief. <laughs> yeah, we must have passed him somewhere during the day. He must have been hiding by yes, in a wood yeah. or something. And he obviously thought he'd come at night and creep through, but oh God. It's hard to creep through in a tank, isn't it? <laughs> mm. uh, so that was good fun as well. Oh my God, Wilderhausen. Oh Wilderhausen. God. Right. Sometimes so, we were lucky and sometimes Yes, we were. and sometimes they were unlucky. Uh. Mm. <laughs> So near to the end, um, <clears throat> you were passing on a, a, a wireless message, <laughs> which was... Close down now. <laughs> right. And that was just after VE day. Yes, about ten days after they decided we'd do away with the wireless search, we would use uh, telephones instead. And they put all these telephones in, because Joe Muggins, I got the job of running the switchboard. Um, so I had the job of getting on the blower and saying, all stations, Abel Baker 5-0, which is the whole lot, prepare to close down. And then I had to wait for him to reply and tick off on a bloody great list. Well, there must have been, um, there must have been 500 of them, because they're all the tanks, all the armoured cars. Oh, dear God, it went on and on. Well, some of the blokes, they decided the war was over, but it had finished. <laughs> Some of them are busy making a cup of tea <laughs> or gone to the toilet. 
some of them, they were answering for four tanks at a time using different voices. <laughs> <laughs> it took me as about, you would, as you. It would. took me about an hour to get all these bloody things ticked off. So then yeah. I said, "All yeah. station, naval bankers, Charlie five zero, closed down now out." Right. And then we could use our wireless sets, you see, to listen to AFN Bremen, the voice of the Bremen on, <laughs> which was the the, the, uh, the American American the American station. Forces Network. Yes, 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 and that, yes. or the BBC uh, Forces Network. Mm. Be playing some Benny Goodman and stuff yes. like that. Mm. Yes, their signature tune was on the sunny side of the street. Right. <laughs> um, you actually good. now this is obviously we've now gone past VE Day. The fighting was over, um, but of course you were still in Germany at oh, the time. Oh yes, and this is where um, worried about the Russians coming. <clears throat> uh, well, quite. <laughs> we wondered whether they were going to cross over and start the next war, but you had some time off. Oh, a bit now and again, yes. And you went a bit sightseeing. <laughs> Sightseeing round the to Mona Dam. Dam. Went to Mona Dam, yes. Yes, what happened? The the armies uh, commandeered the big hotels around there, so that if you were lucky, you could go there for a weekend for a, a break. And uh, my pal Fred and I, we got we got passes one weekend, so off we went, and uh, we met these two ATS girls. As you do. As they do. They were on the other side of the lake, you see. We weren't allowed to be on the same side of the lake. <laughs> but we were allowed to meet, meet up in the evening for a dance. Okay. And uh, Fred, uh, who's taller than me, he said, I'll, ta I'll have the tall, pretty one, and you can have the short, plain one. Good old Fred. <laughs> well, that's what good friends are for. <laughs> anyway, he lost his girl the same night. I kept mine for 65 years. <laughs> Serves him right. <laughs> Serves him right. Uh, mm. Dear. It was a funny courtship, but anyway, we got there eventually. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, I found out when we were talking about this, that and the other, when I was in my tank waiting to cross the Rhine, she was in Belgium with an anti-aircraft unit shooting down flying bombs heading for Antwerp docks. Right. Uh, I think she's on the range finder or something. She didn't actually fire the guns, but she... Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Another funny thing. At a time, she, she was... Um, uh, based ability in a convent, <laughs> and the the old mother superior she thought disgusting. These ladies with shorts doing exercises in front of these leering men. <laughs> 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 so uh, when we went back, the wife and I went back for the fortieth anniversary of the liberation, and uh, Ella said, "Well, let's go and just look at that convent, see if it's still." So we went and found this convent. And uh, there were two ladies busy in the garden, so I went across to one and said, could we have a word with the Mother Superior? Oh, yeah, that's her over there. There she was in slacks and, and jumpers and things. Uh, so I went across. Oh, come inside, she said. Would you like a glass of beer? She said, would you like a cigarette? <laughs> things have changed in 40 <laughs> years, God. <laughs> yes, they would have done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Yes, with a glass of beer, have a cigarette. Oh, man, son. <laughs> hey ho, <laughs> that's life, I suppose. Mm. Apparently, it wasn't really a convent anymore. What it was was a Catholic school. Oh, right, a and Catholic uh, retreat or something. Yes, yes. and uh, uh, when we called in, it so happened it was half term, so the okay. children weren't there. But uh, anyhow, the mother said, she showed us around and showed us where Ali used to sleep. And, uh, they had these little cubicles and oh, God. Mm -hmm. Uh, that must have been yes, bittersweet, I suppose. When she was there, mm. they, they, there were a lot of these V1s and things dropping around, and uh, one of them was a very near miss, and most of the picture, the, the glass on the windows was broken, and, and the things fell down. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Virgin Mary, a beautiful uh, thing of it, she wasn't touched. No. <laughs> Makes you wonder. It does, doesn't it? Is there something in there? After? I said that in the, when I went back, back to <coughs> St. Ogan Boss for the 65th anniversary, I mentioned that in my memoir oh, there. And, yeah, we, we fired 90,000 shells into that place uh, ourselves and the Germans from the tanks and the artillery mm -hmm. uh, and that, shops and factories and gunners were all destroyed, but the cathedral wasn't touched. Really? Yeah. We had a lovely service in there when we went back. Amazing. Yeah. Put 
makes you wonder. It does. It does indeed. Yeah, did you see that program the other night about the uh, the, the Germans practice uh, the Americans practicing for D-Day? I and they made a complete pig's ear of it. I didn't see the program, but I've I've heard about it. Slapped and Sands, I yes, believe it was called, yes, where yes. they were. <clears throat> they, I don't. We, Every, nobody knows who's to blame for that. Whether it was every bloody thing went wrong. I mean, the, the idea was there was a British the, screen or whatever. The navy mm. was the navy was supposed to uh, shell the beach, mm -hmm. and then the lads would go in. They got yeah. the timing wrong, so they shelled it when the lads were there. A lot of them were killed on the beach there, yeah. and then. Uh, there were supposed to be two destroyers protecting the other ships. One broke down or something, and, the and then the lost. other one... They, well, they, they couldn't talk to each other, because it was on a different wavelength. Mm. And so these e-boats... E-boats come in and, and, and played sank out. a few ships. Mm. God. Yes, it was um, another example of... Uh, Absolute co chaos. Co cooperation that mm. went wrong. Yeah. There was more... I think there was more killed in than some of the beaches in uh, Normandy. Ah, oh, dear. Shocking. Shocking. No, but it's sword beast. And you think and about, you know, all those young lads who came over just to die on an exercise. Yeah, yeah. It's not, right. it's not fair. It's not right. No. It's like your friends who got killed before yes, the it fighting was. actually started yeah. when you were in Normandy yeah. yourself. Yeah, poor old Phil Bloom. I don't forget yeah. poor old. He's a nice chap. And that. Oh, God. Yeah. What a way to go. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. Thank you very, very much. And I'm sure the well, association I... and <clears throat> all that listen to this in future will be uh, <clears throat> overwhelmed, because I certainly am. I certainly am. After I've, after I've read this yeah, and, and I've know. listened to what you've said... Um, no, well, I, uh, I, find I it thought he might <clears throat> be more interested in the epilogue where I went back for the 65th anniversary. But no, well, it's... everybody... We've, we've got, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to close this now, right? because we might not want to... Go into anything else, but I'm just going to say thank you very much, Henry. Um, that concludes this part of the um, history, particularly the invasion of Europe, the um, the British move through Belgium, Holland, and into Germany. And Henry Garoud was there to see it all. <laughs> okay.